Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. That day, the Lord's Day, repeated over and over in this book of Zechariah, meaning remembered of Yah, meaning He's back. This is why it stated that um, those that pierced Him would see Him in verse 10 of chapter 12 that we just completed. And the, how would you see him? Well, he's returned. That's what the subject is of the Lord's day, and that Christ himself had returned. Th then we came to this 13th chapter, and we found that a fountain was opened. And as I stated, it's not a simple future tense, but a verb, heia, with the particle, meaning that the fountain is open permanently. It's never going to be closed meaning Christ is with us, He's never leaving us again. That is to say, He does it now, but He's here and He's in power. And what a fantastic chapter and a conclusion to this great book of um, Zechariah. You could teach the book of Revelation from the 14th chapter, but this 12th chapter is one I want to spend some time, 13th chapter rather, is one I want to spend some time on because in the close of the last lecture, <clears throat> in verse 2, he stated, And it shall come to pass in that day, that's the Lord's day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. I mean, they're, that's done away with. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Do you, you know when that's done in the book of Revelation? I, I want to read it to you. Okay, you're not going to have it. That's okay. But we need to spend a little time on God cleansing. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. That's when this reaches its fulfillment. This is when Christ returns. Okay. Verse 20, And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet, that's the Antichrist, okay, that wrought miracles before him. That's to say the one world political system, that government and the Antichrist, what happens to them? Um, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, that's how they receive it, and them that worship the image, these both, that's two, that's both of them, the one world political system and the office of Antichrist, what happened to them? They were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. <clears throat> that happened before the millennium. That happened before the great white throne judgment. Well, what does that really do away with? Those two offices. And the, there will be no more of that false teaching, or uh, he will, Satan will never again have the privilege of uh, using the false Christ as a pretense to deceive people. And also he's saying, I'm going to do away with the, the prophets and preachers as well that preach falsely. Now, many people do not understand what a, a bad preacher is. And I think we need to spend a little time on that because deception can lead you into worshiping that false one if you're not careful. <clears throat> so with that, I, I want to go to the 13th chapter of Ezekiel. Spend a little time there to help you recognize a good preacher from a bad one, okay? So that you know whether you should follow one or not. And we're not judging them. This is God's Word telling us how to tell the difference, okay? And that's what this 13th chapter is about, is getting rid of false teachers, false conceptions, and false um, uh, uh, beliefs, if you would. And um, so, so it is. Let's, let's take this 13th chapter of Ezekiel. Here God really gets down where the rubber meets the road. Let's spend just a little bit of time here. 
the first verse of Ezekiel 13 reads, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, that was the word of the Lord coming to Ezekiel, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets. That's not the good ones, this is the bad ones, okay? Of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. That, that separates the good from the bad, out of their own minds. Hear ye the word of the Lord. In other words, a prophet is supposed to repeat what God says to him, not what his own mind dreams up. It might be a sour pickle dream, okay? And he thinks he's a prophet, okay? Beware of men that get on ego trips and think they're a lot more than what they really are. Well, I just know that I'm special to God. All of God, God is not a, he doesn't show partial, he's not partial to anyone. He loves all of his children. He's fair and he's just. And naturally, he uses whomever he will that have the abilities and the gifts to do what he wishes them to do. But that doesn't mean that he thinks more of one than another. So that should keep a lot of people off of an ego trip. What's important is the Word of God. You start prophesying out of your own mind, I can tell you what you're buying a ticket to. Judgment begins with false preachers and prophets. Okay. They're fakes. They really are in bad shape. You heard what God said. I'm going to get rid of them. I'm blotting them out. That's serious, dear one. Verse 3, as we continue, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. In other words, their own little intellect is all that they follow, not God. And they claim to be so much. God talked to me today. Oh, did he? Um, you know, Father does speak to people, but it's always instructions on how to do His work, not put somebody on an ego trip. Verse 4, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. And th this goes back to the Song of Solomon, the greatest love story ever told, what the little foxes do. They come into the vineyard and start horsing around when the little blossoms are just beginning to put on and they knock them off the vines. They stir stuff up. That's what he's talking about. That's all that false prophets do. They just stir things up and destroy the very embryo of truth that God plants into the minds of people and persuades people to believe lies. Well, what lies is their lies, okay? What they dream up. Verse 5, Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. There again is that day of the Lord. In other words, you haven't insured the truth and, and to patch the holes where false teachings come through in the gaps of the hedge that surrounds uh, the truth. It's an analogy, all right? You want to always do that. Well, and why we're here is I want you to know how to do it. I want you to know how to recognize it. If it is not written in God's Word, because He has promised us in, in this great book, in Mark chapter 13, He tells us for one place, I have foretold you all things through the prophets and the apostles. He tells us again in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, I have foretold you all things through the prophets and the apostles. So he, he's not going to send any new prophets just yet. The prophesying is done from this word and what the other prophets have said and what God says. In the very end, when the Holy Spirit takes over, when Antichrist is actually on earth, then both sons and daughters shall prophesy. But it will be what they're not to premeditate but repeat what God gives them in that instant in the hour of temptation. That hour of temptation is not here yet, but it's coming. And the thing is, is you want to prepare the flock to be able to receive that so that they're not deceived, okay? Because that battle day is coming. 
we're in that generation of the fig tree. Verse 6, they have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, the Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them, and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word, only it won't confirm from the word of God. That's how you tell. That's the secret. That's how you know what, what pleases our Heavenly Father. Verse 7, Have you not seen a vain vision? And have you not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, The Lord saith it, albeit I've not spoken. Or it said, I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, that's buying you a ticket, friend. Eight, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, Therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. When Father is against you, you're in a heap of hurt. You know, our Father forgives on repentance. He forgives some pretty bad things on honest repentance. But when it comes to false preaching, when it comes to false prophesying, when it comes to people trying to put words in God's mouth, um, I guarantee you, when he's against it, you're in a heap of hurt. Verse 9, And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord God. They're, they're going to be written out of the book of life. How is it that they could not be with his people? Well, where, is, where are his people located on the Lord's day? In heaven with the Father. And they're not going to be with them. Well, where will they be then? Well, there's only one other place, friend. <laughs> it's not hard to figure that one out. You're either in heaven or you're in hell. Okay. It all takes place right here on earth. So those are some pretty serious charges. And again, I want to reemphasize again, how do you know? God has promised you that he has foretold us all things. So if some man comes along predicting something that is not written in God's word, he's fake. Okay, He's false. Because even because they have seduced my people saying peace and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. In other words, they tell you, this is the way to find salvation. Is you come behind this wall. God is our wall. Don't you ever forget that. Not some whitewashed wall put up by man. And his saying, you could be saved. All you have to do is believe. Well, that's true, but believe in what? The true Christ, not the fake. And if you believe the true Christ, you've got to believe his word. Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that whitewash it, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, yea, O great hailstone, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. He's not putting up with it. It's called the wrath of God. Now, why we came here, is our Father, I'm going to skip all the way down to verse 16, to wit the prophets of Israel which prophesy concerning Jerusalem and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy thou against them. This is to say those that, that um, Find the daughters of Jerusalem are those that, that supposedly are a bride for Christ. Supposed to be preparing the way. Good Christian people. But we'll show you the way to salvation. You, there's only one way to salvation, and it's the way our Father teaches. You can't get there by listening to false prophets, regardless of the gender. What are they doing? Verse 18. And say, 
Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Yeah, we'll save them. Will you hunt the souls of my people and will you save the souls alive that come unto me? They want to come to me. In other words, what, what he's saying here in the Hebrew is I have my outreached saving arms to help the people and you cover them over and teach them some other doctrine. That's false prophecy. What, what kind of doctrine were they teaching them? What, what was it they were saying? Well, let's find out. 19, and will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die, that should have eternal life, and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies. <clears throat> well, what lies is he talking about? Well, don't worry, he'll get there. Verse 20, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against, you got it? God saying, I am against your pillows, wherewith you there hunt the souls to make them fly. And I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. Ah, fly away, oh glory. You know, now, uh, it is true that to be absent from this body is present with the Lord. But God is very much against people teaching a so-called rapture doctrine. Because we put the gospel armor on to stand against the fiery darts of Satan and to know that it is Almighty God that saves us, that He has work for us to do. And the word rapture is not even written in the Word of God. And yet traditions have picked up on it and spread it when it says very clearly, God's against it. <clears throat> How can a Christian want to follow a doctrine that God Himself is against? That doesn't make sense. One more verse. Your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, for and ye shall know that I am the Lord. That's the way it goes. <clears throat> and he will destroy the wicked that teach falsely. You know, again, if it isn't written, <clears throat> it's not true. Number one, there'll be many people say, well, you don't understand, brother. At the last trump, we gather back to Christ. That's right, but guess where Christ is coming? The last trump is what? The seventh. He comes here. But where you mislead people is if you do not teach them what happens at the sixth trump. Well, brother, tell us what happens at the sixth trump. Satan comes to this earth as Antichrist, as that false prophet, and deceives the people through that one world system. It's formulating in the world just today. You better wake up. We're in a, a perilous time. The formulation of that fig tree is sprouting. And you need to be alert. So that's how you tell a false prophet. Okay? It's one that promises you, oh, glory and salvation. When God didn't promise it that way. He has work for his children to do. Now, returning to the 13th chapter of this great book of Zechariah, let's pick it up with verse uh, 3. Is that where we're at? Let's see. Verse 3, after the, that, and it reads, And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live. For thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. Um, and so it is, Deuteronomy 13, 6, 6 through 11. How precious our father is that one's own family will turn on a false prophet. Verse 4, And it shall come to pass in that day, this is again telling you what day, the Lord's day, not maybe, not perhaps, but absolutely, it shall come to pass that the prophet shall be ashamed, every one of his vision, when he hath prophesied 
neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. That's a prophet's garb as Elijah would wear. Did you catch what's wrong with that? Do you understand why God would not be pleased with that? Do you understand? You see, it said, it said, ashamed everyone of his vision, not God's. Not God's vision, not God's truth, but some individuals made up in his own mind bunch of lies, bunch of false teaching, bunch of misleading people. You don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. You're going to fly away. False teaching. The word revelation means to reveal, to uncover, to make known, and you had better be learning because you're in a generation when it comes to pass. Yeah, when he can dress up, he can, he can eat locusts and he can eat honey. That's prophet's food. He can dress like a prophet. He can claim to be a prophet. But if it's his vision, that's all it amounts to. His word, not God's. That's the way you end up in the pit. You do not want to go there. You want to stick with your father's word. Our father grows very angry when you will not listen to him when all he's done for us. He's made things so easy for us. And then you let some vain speaking person mislead you. Always document this man or any person that claims to be teaching God's word out in the word of God. It will prove itself out. Verse 5. But he shall say, I am no prophet. When he's caught in the act, I am an husbandman. I'm a, I'm a farm boy. I'm a rural country boy here. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. It's just, I'm just a rural little city uh, lad out here in the country. That's all I am, not a prophet. When he's caught with his hand in the cookie drawer, um, you know, um, it is, people are strange and there's nothing new under the sun. Well, what is the answer to all this? It's really quite simple. Stick to God's word. Our father is very much against false teachers, false prophets. They come in many sizes and shapes as far as, as houses of God go that claim to be houses of God. I will not judge them, but God's certainly going to. Verse 6 to continue. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer these with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And again, what does that verse mean? I read it to you in the first chapter of Revelation, verse 7, that at the second advent when Christ returns on the Lord's day, verse 10 of that first chapter of Revelation, that's what the Lord's day is they will see those wounds in his hand. Again, what does this verse mean? He's returned. He's standing in the very midst of us. That time is coming, my friend. Now, do you know something? To document that that is Christ, because some, there are some Bible critics that would like to twist even that, false teachers, false prophets. That's just some priest. That's not Christ. No, Christ is the one that has the wounds in his hands. I'm going to document it uh, by going to the teachings of Christ in, um, in the book of Mark, 14th chapter, 27th verse. You listen to it because he's going to repeat the next verse in, in um, this book. We're going to be in the book of Zechariah that we're going to be reading. Listen to the words of Christ to document that's who we're talking about. And Jesus said unto them, verse 27, Mark 14, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, where is it written? Zechariah 13 and verse 7, we're about to get there. I will smite the shepherd and the sheep uh, shall be scattered. But after that I am risen 
I will go before you into Galilee. They should have known. They should have gone straight to Galilee there to, to look for him. No, they wouldn't even let him in. They wouldn't even answer the door. They were afraid. But he, he promised them he was going to Galilee. Now, so that you know, in this 13th chapter of uh, Zechariah, that that's who we're talking about, because that's where it's written. Christ pointed it out. Okay. So you can't deny it. What does verse 7 say? Awake, O sword. What is the sword? It's the tongue of Christ, the word of God, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to bring salvation. So there you have the proof. Don't ever let some higher critic tell you otherwise because Christ's very words document that that was him at his second advent. And the most beautiful thing for you to recognize is there's only one way you can see those pierced hands. As it is written in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, is for him to have returned and be standing among us and see those scars of that piercing for identification. Um, this is, well, I, and I have received the question, well, will the Antichrist have those same st uh, scars? Don't, don't put it past him. Don't be taken in by it. But these will be the real ones. And do you understand the sad part is he received those while he was with his friends. His own disciples, that means his pupils, those he was disciplining in the Word of God, one betrayed him. And as it is written, this is why I, I want to make a point. This is why it's important that you're familiar with what is written. Because as it is written, so it shall be. And there is one place, most of all, that you want to make certain that you are written, not in some church letter in some church house, but in that book of life written in heaven. You want your name to be there and you want to have repented for all your shortcomings whereby you are in good standing there because we're in a time you would not want to be caught short, I guarantee you, because he paid an awesome price that that's what those piercings are about, so that you could be forgiven for your shortcomings, so that you could be forgiven for your sins. Whatever you do, don't listen to a false prophet. You don't need that. Again, well, how, how do I tell? Check him out in the Word of God. You can read, or you, can, you know a teacher that can help you. Verse 8, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, how much? All the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. It is amazing to me how many people will be deceived at that time. And then when you walk out in the world today, you're not all that amazed how many will be deceived and accept the false Messiah that will listen to false prophets and preachers. All you gotta do is walk around and look and listen. And you know that they're ready to receive a Messiah. They'll even worship a rock star. Okay. Somebody that has a big mouth that can claim to be something when they're a, a novice. Okay. Never done anything but got a big mouth. Leading people to the slaughter. Okay. For to the slaughter means a spiritual death to worship the Antichrist. Thank God we have the millennium that a lot of this can be straightened out. Verse 9, to complete the chapter. Verse 9, and it reads, And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. You better be calling on the true Messiah. You got it? In the name of the true Messiah. I will say, 
It is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. Don't be deceived, my friend. You want to be sure who your Messiah is and who your God is in this generation. There are types that spring up. Would-be's. Amateurs. Absolutely have no idea what they're doing, and yet people just, yes, 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 yes. It's a, it's a disgrace. As well-educated in a high-tech world that we live in, that people are, so many people are biblically illiterate. We spend a lot of time on these few verses, but I wanted you, of all people, to be able to tell a false teacher when you hear one. How, how you can prove him out. Don't listen to men. Well, that whole, that whole church teaches that. God's Word doesn't. So you, which do you choose? Do you choose false teaching? Or do you choose the Word of God? For God is against false teaching. And God's Word is the Word that saves you, that puts you into that book of life that gives you eternal life. You're in a generation when deception, well, you read it for yourself, two-thirds. And you know something? One-third, there's a lot of them that are going to be swayed one way or the other. You can sure understand why Jesus said, for the elect's sake, I've shortened the time or there would be no flesh saved. That's how, that's how perfect or seemingly perfect that the false Christ is and the false prophets, the false teachers. They, they can make believers out of many people a lot more than will see the truth. But I want you, of all people, to see that truth, to hang on to it, to hold it dear to your heart, to be blessed by Almighty God. For God is against false teaching. We're not judging people. God's Word does. Our Heavenly Father does. You know, he says, they are Miami, my people. And I tell you, he is our father. He is our Yahweh, our God. Let him know you love him. Won't you do that? Don't miss the next lecture, the conclusion of this great book. It's fantastic. Listen a moment, won't you please? The epistles of John, three letters written by the apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with my little children or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love. And we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. After these words of encouragement, John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray. And there we are, back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or doctrine. Let's don't judge people. God is the judge. We have His Word, and that's what we stick with, okay? Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request? You don't need the telephone number? You don't need an address? Why? God knows what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it out loud. He loves you. He wants you to understand the letter. That's why He made it so simple. If you'll take all the trash that traditions of men bring in that make, try to make void the Word of God and let the Word flow over the buds of your mind where you see the simplicity in which our Father teaches. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide. Father, give us understanding and truth. Father, 
touch in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay, and question time. Viola from North Carolina. Where does it say in the Bible that you will know your loved ones in heaven? Uh, this is one of our most asked questions. It's in Ezekiel chapter 44, which is the millennium. And it states there in verse 20 through 25 that you can go to a loved one, that's mother, brother, sister, unmarried, father. Uh, if, if they didn't quite make it, you can go to them and tell them to get their act together, okay? So naturally, the point being, how would they say mother, brother, sister, and father? Because you can recognize them. You know who they are, okay? We will know each other in heaven, if that's absolute. Judy from Georgia. I've been studying with you for about five years now. I'm a little confused about Ezekiel 38 and 39. When does this prophecy occur? Question. Before or after the Antichrist five-month period? And I am guessing the attack will be uh, from the gates of Alaska. Well, that's where one of them will take place, okay? Isn't that a little ironic that we purchased Alaska from Russia in the manner we did? Uh, and it is ironic. It is. We, we, we purchased it for a burial ground for part of them in one little part. <clears throat> so, uh, actually, it is in about the last few minutes of this earth age because God is the one that fights the battle in Ezekiel 38 and 39. He does not let another army intercede because those who will be following the Antichrist on Mount Zion at that time, this is when Antichrist is descended to this earth, and those that come down from the north, from Rush, as it is written, that's what the chief prince, Meshach, chief prince is in the Hebrew is Rush, Okay, and, and um, they, they come down from the north and uh, they, they believe there's no God. And boy, does our father intend to make show them there is a God because he's going to meet them and he doesn't need our help, I guarantee you. He'll take care of business on, on both um, Armageddon, which is in the valley of Megiddo, on Mount Zion, Megiddo means the gathering place of the crowd. What crowd? Satan's crowd. <clears throat> Cheryl from Oklahoma City. Do you believe the rapture of the church will be before, during, or after the appearance of the Antichrist? Well, I think after today's lecture, I probably answered that for you. There is no rapture. So uh, we'll be here when the Antichrist comes. And there's duties you're supposed to do if you're a Christian. And it's written in Mark 13. You're supposed to not premeditate, but give what the Holy Spirit gives you at that moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Will we be, just be taken, or will there be some kind of choice to make at that time? Well, I hope you make a choice, and I hope it's to love the Lord Jesus Christ and not the fake. Because the false prophets and the false teachers are coming. And... It's amazing how these questions fall in because this poor lady has listened to false traditions. And she is, but she is coming around because she cannot decide when that so-called event is going to transpire, see. The fact of the matter is it just isn't going to happen. Christ is returning to us. Christ is coming here. We're not going anywhere. Heaven itself is established right here on earth. It is well written if you've ever studied the book of Revelation. In Revelation 21, right here, forever, it is changed and cleansed for a reason. Because as, as God stated in Eze way back in Ezekiel chapter 16, this is my favorite place in the universe, and I wed her, geographically speaking. And he made a covenant with Mount Zion. That, that is where heaven will be established forever and ever and ever. That's why we could, at the beginning of that 13th chapter we were in today, where, whereby that fountain that was opened isn't temporary, but forever. 
And it's right there where that fountain will be opened, a fountain of truth. Uh, Carl from, um, Carl from, no, Curtis, rather, from Canada. I'm 11 years old. Could you please tell me where in the Bible it says that your loved ones that have passed on can come to visit you here on earth? My grandpa passed away a month ago, and the other night he came in my room and he tucked me in. I wasn't scared. I knew he was just making sure that I am all right. Well, you know, our Father, through the Holy Spirit, has a way of blessing those to let people know that uh, to be absent from this body is present with Him and that everything is well and everything is all right. Uh, you, you were blessed, certainly, by the, by the Holy Spirit that allowed this to happen, uh, Curtis. Uh, God bless you. Uh, you will be, well, someday we'll be back with your granddad. You're going to see him again, okay? We're going to, he's coming with the Lord Jesus Christ. They got a little bit of straightening out here to do. Carol from Canada. Could you please explain the difference between the seals, the vials, and the trumps? Thank you for your great teaching and your staff. Well, thank you for remembering the staff. Uh, the trumps, vials, and the seals. First is the seals. Where do the seals go? As it is written in Revelation chapter 7, they go right up here. They are sealed in your mind. In other words, it is God's truth of seven events that shall transpire, exactly how they shall transpire and what shall happen within them. And you are to know those and have them sealed in your mind as it is written that must happen before the end can come to pass. I, I will state it more specifically. <clears throat> These seals will be locked in the minds of God's election before the end can come to pass. As soon as that happens and everything else is set to God's own choosing, then the end shall come. What the seals do then is... The seals tell you what happens in the trumps and the vials, okay? Now, the trumps on the other... In other words, the seals are the process of learning and loading your mind where you're not deceived, where you're a better servant for Almighty God. Now, the trumpet... What does a trumpet do? It sounds action, execute. Execute the command of God, okay? It is action. That's when it transpires. That's when it takes place. But what about the vials? You know, this word in the Greek, uh, vial, you would think, well, that, that's one of those little tinkerbell things, you know, that we can just sprinkle along. No, it's a big, open mouth, flat dish that whop. When it comes out, it is the wrath of God poured out. Okay. And that's what the, the vials are. The most interesting thing you learn in the sixth trump, the sixth seal, and the sixth vial, that Satan appears, he's the subject of each of those. That's 666. It's the number of one that appears at the sixth trump, which is none other than Satan himself, the number of the man Antichrist, his office is Antichrist, as it is written in Revelation 13, 18. How simple God makes His Word. And you know, you know how further He simplified it? All seven of those events, Jesus, on that sermon, in Matthew, in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, gives all seven of those events where a child can understand it, all laid out in chronological order, as the events come to pass, so that no one can be deceived. <clears throat> when we study God's Word and listen to our Father rather than traditions of man. Okay, uh, Patricia from Missouri. I hope you will take time to help me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 16, is it a sin for a woman to cut her hair, their glory? How about to even color um, in, um, well, now, again, now you're saying here, um, 1 Corinthians 13 through 16, you, you've got to drop back to verse 10 
to pick the subject up. Okay. Verse 10, but it isn't hair. Not even talking about hair, though it's translated that. What it's saying is a woman better be covered, covered with what? Covered with the Lord Jesus Christ. She better have Christ over her head. Because of what? Verse 10, because of the angels. Why? Because the fallen angels along with the Antichrist are being kicked out on earth again. And guess who they're after? The same as they were the first time. As it's written in Genesis chapter 6. They refused to be born to woman because they wanted to seduce woman. And this is why a woman wants to be sure she has Christ over her head when Satan and his angels are kicked out to this earth. Again, you will find the answer to your question in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10. <clears throat> uh, Deanne from Tennessee. Deanne, when, when, when a young person that is um, a sin committed in ignorance is no sin. That's not forgivable, okay? It is forgivable. So when, when a young person commits a sin that they didn't even know or understand in completeness, then repent, let our Father know it, and go in peace. All right, you're, you're in good shape. Uh, Karen from Missouri. Oh, let's see where this question is. Been a long time since I've written. Where is your question? Um, okay, uh, it's been a long time since I've written a question. When Jesus returns at the seventh trump, he's returning with his army. Please clarify is that army all those from the right side of the Gulf? Or if so, where and what happens to those on the wrong side? The right side come with him as an army. Those on the other side are taught in the millennium. As it is written in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, we reign as priests. What do priests do? They teach for a thousand years with Christ. With who? With Christ. That is to say, the true Christ. Revelation 20, verse 5. Um, Michelle from Florida. Question, do the two witnesses, Revelation 11, prophesy in the second earth age or do they prophesy in the millennium? They prophesy today in this, this, um, dispens this, um, this time period, okay? They, as a matter of fact, the two witnesses will appear a short time before even the false Christ does. Because the two witnesses are given a period of time, 1,260 days. That's solar days. Whereas the Antichrist is only given, before the time was shortened, 42 months. That's 42 moons. 42 moons, if I remember correctly, are about 10 days short of 1,260 days. All right? So the two witnesses will appear before the false Christ does. Uh, Rob from North Carolina, I would really, really appreciate any advice you can give me. Uh, what is your question here? Um, what is the what is the importance of any about the number seven that seems to be everywhere in God's word? Well, it's the meaning of it. It means spiritual completeness. And it lets you know that that's, that's perfect completeness, spiritually speaking, as Father would have it. Okay. Just like there are 7,000 of God's elect, that means it is spiritually complete. Within, when, when you have all of God's elect, that's spiritual completeness. All right. They're all sealed, and then the end comes to pass. Regina from Kansas, um, a question. When you die and want to be cremated, is that bad and will you still go to heaven? It doesn't have anything to do with whether you go to heaven or not. Okay. To be absent from this body, you're absent from this body is not going to heaven. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord, meaning your spiritual body does go to heaven. This body goes back to dirt documentation 
Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Your spirit, the intellect of your soul, meaning your soul and spiritual body, instantly go back to the Father that gave it. But this body goes back to dirt, from dust from which it came. <clears throat> so, financially speaking, I know that's why a lot of people prefer cremation because it's a lot less expensive than, um, than um, uh, uh, all the frills of, uh, uh, of a funeral service with expensive caskets and so on and so forth. Uh, so, and some people can't afford that. Don't worry about it. It has nothing to do with going to heaven, quite frankly, because a good Christian is already in heaven, okay, when, when that service takes place. Again, to repeat, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, to be absent from this body is present with the Lord. Daryl from California. A question, the souls of babies unborn... Uh, say a miscarriage, do they get born again since they never came from the womb? No, the spirit is there and you can only pass through this earth age once. A soul that dies in the womb is a death of a soul, of a body rather. And uh, you might say they kind of get a free ride through this earth age. I think there are some people maybe God feels are too good for this earth age. <clears throat> but um, they, they are a living being in the womb and they die there and it is only given that man should die once. Um, Robert from New Jersey, I have a, a question. When an individual dies, will one remember how it happened? Example, if someone was to kill one will one remember the person who did it? Well, God will, okay? Our Father certainly will. If we supposed uh, to, are we supposed to, and, and that person does too. You're not gonna forget something like that if, if it's known. If we supposed to, are we supposed to teach God's words and only uh, taught a few people? Is that a sin and will God punish us if we're not teaching everyone? No, just all you do is plant seeds, okay? Unless you're a minister, you, you simply plant seeds when God makes it obvious it's time to plant one, okay? Don't um, always protect your credibility as a Christian. You know, don't, don't uh, override or abuse someone that is not the least bit interested in hearing the word. God will let you know when someone's interested in hearing. Then you plant the seed. Uh, Becky from Kentucky. Somewhere in the Bible it states a woman should not wear anything pertaining to a man. Does that mean women should not wear pants? Explain to me, please, because some people say it's a sin. It is, it is not a sin. You're, you're quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. And, and I get this quite a bit. What it states is that a, a woman should not wear men's clothing it, but what it truly means, the, the, um, it is an idiom meaning a woman should not take a man's part in a sexual act. Okay. Or a man should not wear women's clothing, meaning, you see, to take someone in the Bible is to place your cloak over them. Okay. It has to do with clothing, to take your cloak over them. So when, when they do this, Romans chapter 1 gives you a little better idea. Quite frankly, men wore skirts when Deuteronomy 22.5 was written. So if we were to go by the actual fact of what they were wearing at the time that instruction was given, a woman would not allowed, be allowed to wear a dress. But it has nothing to do with apparel other than that sexual act, okay? Car, uh, Carl and Robin from North Carolina. In 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, verse 7, is this talking about the ones that believe in the rapture, that they will let themselves be deceived until God takes them out of his way when he returns to expose, uh, to cast Satan into the pit? Um, the, no, it, the, the verb in verse 7 of chapter 2 Second Thessalonians is a transitive verb. A transitive verb, only he who lets will let till he be taken out of the way. 
you have to go back to verse 4 and 5 to find out who the he is. Okay. That's what a transitive verb does. Okay. And you find out that's the Antichrist. Who, where is he held and how is he taken out of the way? He is held by Michael in heaven, chapter 12, the book of Revelation, verse 6 and 7, until he is cast out onto the earth. Okay. It's talking about the very coming of the Antichrist. Uh, Kathy from Texas, um, question, my grown son says he's not against God, yet he doesn't know that God exists. He says he knows there's a higher power. Is he cursed by God? In, in the, no, he's not cursed. He's confused. But uh, you continue setting the example as a Christian should. Do not, do not to try to force him to believe. You can't do that. You just set the example, and, and don't worry, pray, pr pray the intercessory prayer for him that uh, God will touch him, and he will see that he will know and that he will understand. You know, there are many people, because of what is taught in the world today, that are driven away from church because of what is taught, rather than the sound word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Be patient with him, and uh, he is certainly not cursed because he's got a good mother that has taught, raised him right. You, he'll come around. I'm out of time. Hey, I, lo I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but most of all, God loves you for that, okay? You know what? It makes his day when you study the letter he's written to you, and when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. But most important, you listen to me good now, you hear. You stay in His Word every day, and His Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.